the authority of a man of God. Now, we've been talking about some of the difficult things we've had to face and the battles we're fighting and the onslaught in our lives, but now we're gonna talk about the good news, how Christ gives us power and authority, how Christ himself has power and authority. If you remember in Isaiah 61, he, you know, he talks about that. And then Luke, his first sermon, he repeats that same message saying, the spirit of the Lord is on me. In other words, there's an authority in my life because he has anointed me. That's another authority-based word. He's anointed me, set captives free, to bring liberty to those who are bound, to preach good news to the poor. And see, these, these are breakthrough words. These are words of the power of the Holy Spirit that moves mightily in our life. And Jesus took that authority that the Father gave to him and he did something unique with it. A lot of us, when we get some authority, uh, I don't want to get into government and stuff, but have you noticed when the government gets a little bit of authority, what they do with it? Uh, they, they tend to like it and want to sort of hold it and, and become even more of, uh, active in uh, gaining more authority. Well, Jesus was the opposite of that. He, he, wanted to, he kept his authority that he had. He had all authority. It was his. But in his love, he decided to give it away to his to his brothers, to his children, and he has given us authority. We see this in uh, Matthew chapter 10 and verse five. This is the 12 apostles. After he had prayed, uh, the father spoke to him about who to choose. He chose the 12, verse five, and the 12 were sent out. And he sent the 12 out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles, neither into the town of the Samaritans, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're, that's... That's a cosmic warfare uh, description of what Jesus came to do. The, there's a kingdom coming that's replacing an old way of kingdom living. There's a, there's a new kingdom. There's a new sheriff in town, so to speak. And he's speaking of his authority. And then he's telling them, now you go, and here's what, you just, what you're to say. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. And then he goes on to give them some instructions. As you know, they go out and, and they do as Jesus said. Then in... Um, if you turn to Mark, I believe it's Mark chapter 6. I want to take a brief look at that. <coughs> Excuse me. Mark chapter 6, verse 7, and he called the 12. This, again, this is Mark chapter 6, verse 7. And he called the 12, and he began to send them out two by two, and he gave them what? What's the word there? Authority. He gave them authority. Okay, you're seeing that, right? This is um, a lot of times what I think we like to do and you have to hear me what I'm saying very carefully or you'll think my words might, it could be easily twisted. We tend to think that the only authority that exists is, is a non-delegated authority, like that, that Jesus has all authority, and he absolutely does, okay? So I'm making that clear. All authority is based in him. Anything we have is delegated authority. But delegated authority, is it not still authority? In the military, if you send your lieutenant, if a general sends his lieutenant out with commands, the, the, the lieutenant doesn't have to say, my general told me to tell you this, right? I mean, he could if he wants to, but he can say, get up and do this because he has authority. He's been delegated that authority. And so it's very important we understand that Jesus in his delight over us, even though he's a sovereign God, has all authority and could do everything himself without you. He doesn't need you. But in his love and his grace and his mercy, he delights in bringing you into his authority and saying, I'm going to share my authority with you. I'm going to give you some authority. You're going to see, and one of the things that later we'll see is the disciples said it brought them great joy. A lot of times when men are lacking joy, it's because they're lacking the true authority that God's given them. They no longer are walking in that authority. They're not walking in authority with their children, not walking in authority with their, their uh, families, their, their spouse, not walking in authority with, uh, according to the calling and the careers and the giftings that God's put in your heart, the, the design for your life. You're not taking authority over that, and therefore you're lacking joy. So Jesus says, no, I want you to have this authority. And one of the things, that, what he says in this authority is you preach the gospel, you heal the sick, you raise the dead and you cast out demons. You take authority over the powers of darkness. And here he, he, he kind of narrows it here a little bit. He doesn't use the other things, preach the gospel, heal the sick. He's basically saying here, and he sent them out two by two and he gave them authority over unclean spirits. So he kind of encapsulates the command of our authority. It's over. And remember, in the context here, he's, he's preaching to us about the kingdom that's at hand. He's, he's inaugurating a new kingdom. And it's, and, and, it, and it's coming in power and in substance and in glory, but not in the fullness yet. Later on, Paul talks about this and says, we don't see everything under his foot yet. It's, 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 it's going to be one day, but not yet. But substantially, the kingdom has come. 
And the people of God, particularly the men of God, are been given authority by God to take that kingdom that's at hand and expand the kingdom. It, it, it's evangelism, yes. It's, it's, uh, it's teaching, yes. It's church planting, yes. It's missions work, yes. It's raising godly families, yes. It's all of the above, and it's the authority. But the authority that he, he says here has something to do with bringing a kingdom and replacing the powers of darkness. The, the, um, one of the things, what did I do with my marker? One of the things that uh, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, uh, in, in one of my favorite translations, it says, Jesus appeared to destroy the things that the devil does. And that, that, I love that translation. Uh, what, Jesus, here's why I came. The devil's doing some stuff, right? He's doing some things. Why did Jesus come? I came to destroy the things that the devil does. So if you could kind of draw a circle in your life and say, here's the stuff that the devil does in my life. He's causing, here's some sin things. Here's some wound things. Here's some pain things. Here's some crisis things. And then the Bible says Jesus came to destroy those things that the devil does. Now, the exciting thing about that, I get, I get thrilled about this, is that it says that he's given you authority now to do the same thing that Jesus appeared to do, to, to destroy the things that Satan does. So, so if Satan is causing addiction, he's given you the power and authority over that. If he's come into your life to cause marriage, uh, Satan's come to destroy, kill your marriage, he's given you authority in that marriage. Most of us men do not know even an inkling of the true authority and power that God's given to us. We have much more than we realize. It's, it's a reservoir deep within us that's so untapped, so unused, so, so, so uh, lacking in our, our, our spiritual gumption to get up and say, I can, I, can, I can be a part of what Jesus is doing in his kingdom work on earth today by using the authority that he's implanted into my life. Uh, one last passage of scripture, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. You guys with me? All right, and then it says, and this, now, he, now it's not just the 12. And why, this, why is this important? It was 12, and now all of a sudden it's, some say 70 or some say 72. Um, but sending out the 70, <coughs> excuse me, well, why is that important for us today? Well, some people say, some theologians say, and particular denominations say, uh, the, the power invested in the 12 was only an apostolic power for the first century church. And that has ceased from happening today. So don't expect to heal the sick. Don't expect to raise the dead. Don't expect to cast out demons. Don't expect to be used in authority to destroy the works, the things that the devil does. Uh, that was just for, well, for me, this kind of blows that out of the water because these aren't the 12 apostles. These are 72 just unique followers of Jesus, just like guys like you and me. We're, we just sort of wanted to join up in the, the, the group of Jesus. And he says, why don't you guys go out now? You're not the 12 who are gonna sit on the 12 thrones, but you are 72 who can go out. And what does he say to them? And 72 return, uh, um, basically what he says there is the same thing that he said to the, to the 12 on these two different occasions we've read. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, destroy the works of the devil. And, and they go out and they do this. And it's interesting to me what they come back and they say, because if I, if I were gone and I was given that kind of authority, being that I, I like to teach and preach, I would come back and say, Jesus, I, I preached a sermon and people liked it. Isn't that exciting? Or maybe, you know, like, hey, I prayed for a few sick people and I saw somebody get healed. I'm so excited about that. In my uh, level of, uh, or, you know, organizing things, char charting things out, prioritizing things, I don't know that I would put casting out demons as number one or destroying the works of the devil or uh, putting down the things that the devil does. But the, the 72 come back and they say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And they said, and Jesus, uh, was, look at that, verse 17. The 72 returned with what? Joy. The, 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 the joy they got was, was doing this. There's things that Satan is doing in, in my life, in my children's life, Certain things that Satan's doing in my church, certain things Satan is doing in my community, in, my, in the schools that are around us, in the city that I live, in the state that I live, in the region that I live, and we get to be sent out by Jesus with authority. We can heal the sick and we can preach the gospel, the good news, but the things that brings joy here, according to this scripture, was that the, this realm of darkness was under the authority of the believer, that, the, that there was a, an authority placed in uh, this delegated authority in Christ implanted in you and I so that we now have authority 
and even the demons are subject. And Jesus says, verse 18, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, and behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Uh, man, that word is, is frightening and joyful all at the same time. Uh, I, I would almost rather have said, Gary, you're okay because I have authority. You're going to go forth and when you preach and when you pray for the sick and when, you, and when you deal with the powers of darkness in your life and other people's lives, your children's lives, your family's life, you, uh, you're going to have authority there and you're going to have to use that authority. And if you don't use that authority, certain things may not happen. And if you use that authority, certain things happen. I, I'd almost rather just sit back and say, Jesus, do you mind just doing it yourself? Because uh, I, I can trust your authority. I can trust your power. And I know you know what you're doing. So just go ahead and do it. You're God. I'm not. But it's interesting that Jesus delights in us being filled with joy over getting to do the things that Jesus does. To do the works of Jesus. To be like Christ. Christ's likeness is not just morality. It's authority as well. It's using the authority that God has for us. You, you believe that? All right, so you're probably asking the question then is, where does this authority come from? Jesus said it himself, that the Father has given him all authority. Um, but in Colossians, Colossians chapter two, you guys have your Bibles with you? And if you're younger than me, you probably have your cell phone with you, right? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Colossians chapter two, verse six. Uh, let's actually go to verse eight. Uh, See to it that no one takes you captive. Uh, again, it's, it's, this is, a, this is a, a delegated authority mandate from the Lord. You see to it. It's, 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 he's not saying here, I will see to it for you because I have all authority in heaven. He's saying, I've delegated this authority to you. This is, there's a requirement that under my delegated authority, you have to see to this thing happening in your life. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit. This is what we're talking about today. This is empty deceit. This, these are lies of the devil. This is the accuser of the brethren trying to cast us down, keeping us from our high calling. And so, <coughs> so the command of Jesus is to take authority over these things, this, this kind of philosophy, this kind of deceit, according to the human tradition, an element of spirits of the world. These are the demonic spirits that we're talking about. This is this realm here that Jesus came to destroy the things that the devil does. And now he's calling us, <coughs> excuse me, calling us into that action with him. And then look at verse, uh, verse 10. Uh, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So he's the head of all rule and authority, but you've been filled with him. You've been filled with his rule and authority for the things that he wants you to do in your life and in your ministry. Uh, in him, you're also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Uh, verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith and the power of the working of God who raised him from the dead and you who were dead in the trespasses and uh, uncircumcision of your flesh, look at this part, it's really amazing here. God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing them over, by tri triumphing over them. Verse 16, therefore let no one pass judgment on you when it talks about food or Sabbath or festivals. 17, these are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Verse 18, uh, therefore let no one disqualify you. And I want to just stop there. <clears throat> the, 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 what we see in verses 14, 15 is the thing that Genesis uh, talked about. Do you remember when when there was the fall in the garden and the, the curse on the, on the serpent who comes in and does these things that we're talking about here today, he, the, the, the curse of, of the Satan was that he would wound the heel uh, of, 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 the, of the woman, but, but his head would be crushed. And this is, this is exactly what Jesus did here. So he's talking about the crushing of these accusations, the, the tearing down of these lies. And so he, he says that... 
He's disarmed them. Uh, he put them to open shame. He canceled the record of debt. So every time you, what kind of authority do you have over this realm of darkness? Particularly when it comes to the own accusations that you're hearing over your mind. What kind of authority do you have when the devil says you're not worth it, you're no good, you're a loser, you're not gonna make it, your family's gonna be destroyed. You have the authority of Jesus on the, and the power and authority that you have delegated comes from, hallelujah, thank God, comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the, it's the, it is finished, I have defeated, I have stepped on the head of this snake that comes to every garden that you have in your life. Every time you have a snake in your garden, your marriage, your children, your family, your finances, there comes along this report, this is the report of the Lord, that he has dealt a death blow to that, to that debt, to that accusation, to that lie. He's disarmed, he's put it to open shame. He's, he's uh, canceled the record of debt that stood against us. The legal demands of that. So when sometimes when Satan lies, his lie, have you ever noticed sometimes it's based on a little bit of a truth? Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, you always give in to that temptation. Well, that's an accusation, but it also could be kind of a truth. Well, Jesus says that's a, that's a legal demand. That's, that's, a, that's a legal, like, so, so Satan, when he, when he comes before Christ at the throne and, he, and he's voicing his accusations against us, he actually could have some legal demands and saying, legally, I saw him cheat on his wife. And so he is, I'm not just accusing him, he's, I'm accusing him of something he's actually guilty of. And so the good news is that Jesus not only destroys the lies that are told about us, but he actually deals with the truth that the enemy speaks over us. And, and he cancels that debt. He puts that debt down. And so here you are, you're free from false accusations and lies, but you're also free from, you could stand before, if you were there in that court of heaven and you saw Satan accusing you and saying, uh, yeah, he got drunk last night or he cheated on his income tax and you're going, oh my goodness, I did do that. That's not an accusation or a lie, that's truth. And Jesus will say no, because that is no longer a legal demand against him. I've already dealt a death blow to that thing. You are free, you are cleansed, you are washed, you are made new, you're redeemed. There's no, there's no record held against you. Jesus is standing there as the, as the judge, the righteous judge, and he's saying, I hold nothing against their account. I have nothing. The debt has been canceled. Brothers and sisters, or brothers and no sisters here, but brothers, you are free. Isn't that good news? Whom Christ has set free is free indeed. Hallelujah. And so this is the anointing. This is the anointing that breaks the yoke. The cross is really the anointing. The anointing is not some raising your level of speech or saying hallelujah a whole lot when you're preaching. The anoint, you know, because some people can, can yell and holler and scream and you can leave thinking, that's the most anointed sermon I've ever heard in my life. And when you walk through that back door, you have no idea and remembrance of what the guy just said. Because all it was was, it was fluff and, and just random hallelujahs. Uh, and I'm not against hallelujahs, hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah, I'm, I'm, I'm for them. But, but anointing is, is based on the work of Jesus on the cross. It's, it's, that's what sets the captives free. That's what casts out demons. That's what comes against powers and principalities. It's being able to say, we, we have a legal right. We have an authority. This, is not, this isn't based on I prayed 12 hours the last week. This is based on whether I prayed 12 hours or not, I have, in the power of the cross of Jesus Christ, authority over you, Satan. You don't have legal access to my heart, my mind, my body. You don't have legal access to my marriage. You don't have demands against me and my children. Everything that's gone wrong, Jesus has canceled it out on the cross. The debt's been totally paid. And therefore, we can speak into the realms of the powers of darkness. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Because you just been, you go back to the pit because all those lies are not working. And even the truths you're saying against me have already been resolved. Have already, the penalty has already been paid. I owe nothing. And I have authority now to speak those things into the name, uh, uh, through the name of Jesus. Another passage I want to look at is, is in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. It's a passage <coughs> that I'm, I'm, th I'm thinking that some of you might be familiar with. Verse 10 of... Uh, Revelation chapter, <coughs> I'm so sorry, I'm just kind of getting over a bit of a cold here. Um, verse 10 of chapter 12. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority, isn't that a good word right there? Boy, I'm so glad, it's, look, at those, look at the strength of this thing. Loud voice, salvation, power, kingdom, 
and authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before God. And so the authority that Jesus takes is his authority. It's his paying the, the penalty for all of our, uh, all of these things that could be spoken against us, these words that could be spoken against us. Jesus pays for them on the cross, nails them to the cross. And so when he nailed, every accusation that you thought of when I was talking about this earlier this today, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough, you can never outwit yourself with that. Does that make sense? You can't wrap your mind around like, like okay, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not enough. Well, I'm going to look in the mirror and click my heels together three times and say, I am enough, I am enough, I am enough. You know, you're not going to outwit that in your own power. It has to come to the, that's why we're going to the authority of Christ. He, he, he is the one who steps on the head of that snake in the garden of, of our lives. And yet, at the same time, the accuser of the brethren is, is conf confronted here. In verse 11, it says, and the, the second word here in the, the ESV is, and they, T-H-E-Y, they. That's, that's, you know who that is? That's, that's you and me. That's, that they is an us today. Uh, and again, so here, do you see what I'm talking about? This is not necessarily just all Jesus kind of doing it from heaven and we're sort of bystanders. It's, it's some, we're, we're involved. We're called, right? We're commissioned. We're, we're commanded. We, we're, we're meant to engage in the spiritual warfare. We're meant to be part of the battle. And so it's the, the they is us. And we, you might could say here, and we have conquered. And, and it says three things here, how we get engaged in this battle over things that are happening, the accusations in our life, the traumas in our families, the circumstances that are gone awry in our life, the, the pain, the wounds. How do we battle against those things? How do we see victory in those things? It's, it's the authority of Christ over Satan, but then it's the delegated authority, and it gives us three things here. Let's go through these real, real quickly. Number one, they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb, by the blood of the lamb. Now, I'm gonna get old-fashioned here. I'm gonna get a little Pentecostal here. When I hear about the blood of the lamb, uh, man, my, I just, my, my hair stands on end. I just, the, the, you know, the, I think a lot of the new generation doesn't really like to talk about the blood. It's kind of an offensive thing. Uh, it's like not socially acceptable. But man, the old school stuff, I, I wanna invite you, if you've not been in that, get in the old school stuff. We used to, in my family prayer meetings when I was a child, one of my favorite times was when we get together and my dad would say, we're gonna plead the blood of Jesus. And I said, what is that? What do you mean plead the blood? Oh, blood, come. You know, it's just, it kind of sounded kind of weird. But when I finally realized what it was is to plead the blood is, is to bring uh, in your spirit man, in your renewed mind, to bring to bear the blood of Jesus over every situation in your life. To plead, Lord Jesus, bring that blood. There's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power. In uh, my early days of Teen Challenge, the Spanish brothers would go, I pode, I pode. There's power. There's power in the blood of Jesus. That's, that's, that's a, there's a power unleashed. Nothing causes fear in Satan's heart than, more than the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing will cause him to flee like having a Christian take authority and say, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over my mind. It's full of anxiety. It's full of fear. It's full of stress. It's full of doubt. It's full of uncertainty. It's full of condemnation. And I, I rebuke that now, and I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind. Accusations, you must go. Assaults, you must stop. The, that debt has been paid, and now the blood of Jesus has washed me. It's not just forgiven my sins. That's a huge part of it, but it's renewed my mind. It's given me a new confidence. Isn't that good news? Amen. What God has done for us? Plead the blood of Jesus. Plead the blood of Jesus. One of my sons, uh, to, to my great despair, um, even though my father uh, was the founder of Teen Challenge and is helping tens of thousands of drug addicts all around the world, even today, there, while I'm speaking to you, there's over 20,000 uh, people that have been involved in life in substance abuse who are getting set free, even as I'm speaking to you right now. I mean, let's put our hands together and thank the Lord for that. That's, that's, I mean, think of that, 20, 25,000 <laughs> men and women uh, hearing some of these messages about the pleading the blood of Jesus over their life. But in my own life experiences, one day, I, I, <coughs> I'm so sorry, I'm waking you up there by, uh, uh, in my own experience, uh, I live in Colorado, and my teenage son, he's probably 14 years old, he came home one day, and he smelled kind of funny. You know what I'm talking about already? Kind of that, that's, a, that's a really weird cologne he's wearing. And I said, what is that? He goes, oh, we had a campfire. 
tonight. And it's this, just the, the smell of the smoke of the campfire. Oh, okay, campfire. But I kind of got suspicious when he was like having a campfire every night of the week for about two months. And I, I should have known better. But, and so, man, so I started praying over him. Lord, you know, you got to get a hold of my son's life. This is, this is really scary. And then, uh, and then it was like he added, uh, we, the more we prayed, the worse he got. It, just to be blunt with you about the story here. Uh, he went from uh, smoking pot to taking pills, uh, from taking pills to uh, 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 crack and uh, smoking heroin to actually, and the, probably I'd say maybe one of the worst days of my life, he came home one day and had his sleeves rolled up and he had the, the black track marks. He was shooting heroin into his veins. I'm thinking this is, uh, I'm I think fifth, maybe sixth generation ministers in my family. So my sons could be sixth or seventh generation pastors and leaders and yet, and my father starts this ministry to help set t- tens of thousands of captives free, and I can't even keep my own son straight. Condemnation, accus- you talk about accusations, You're, you should quit the ministry. You, what did you do wrong? You didn't spend any time with him. You, you said your father was emotionally unavailable. You're 10 times worse than he was, and you know, just on and on all these accusations. And my son got worse and worse as it goes, uh, and it got to the place he was stealing from us, he was, he was taking things to, to buy his drugs. And so, again, a very horrible day in, in my wife and I's life was uh, having to ask him to leave our home. And, uh, he was an older teenager, maybe even 20 at the time. And uh, just that worst day, and tears were rolling down his face. You know, we live in Colorado. It was the middle of winter. It was like February, and I asked him to leave. He goes, Dad, I don't, I don't have a place to go. I, don't, uh, I burned all my bridges with my friends. They're not going to let me stay with them. And I said, you, you can't stay here. And he just, he wept, and I wept, and he, but he wouldn't leave. Then he started getting angry, and we actually had to call the police. And I, I've never had such an overwhelming day of grief and pain and sorrow of, of seeing the police come and grab my son by his arms and just drag him out of my house. It's just like... Oh God, how can this happen to me? I can't believe it. And then he would call me at you know, three or four in the morning, Dad, I'm, I'm freezing out here. I'm on the streets. He was homeless. I'm on the streets. How, how can I, how can I, how, I can't live like this. And I said, are you ready to change? And he said, I, I don't know. And um, just to try to bring the story to an end, he, he called me one night. It's probably two, three in the morning. He called me, said, uh, or actually it was a little later in the morning. He called me, said, Dad, are you sitting down? I thought, oh no. I was like, uh, what, what, what's, you know, did, did he hurt somebody or did he get hurt or did, you know, did something? And he, he said, uh, you know, <coughs> excuse me, it was just, it was kind of a petty, uh, a petty crime. I, I stole some stuff from a habit and, but I got caught and I'm in jail for just a couple weeks here. Uh, and I was like, oh man, now it's jail. And it's just, you know, how these, these stories can get worse and worse and worse. And I, you know, overdose or uh, life in prison, that's where a lot of these stories end up. And so I just was overwhelmed with grief and sorrow, and, but praying, but praying, 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 and believing and trusting God. And so this night, this morning, he called me and said, are you sitting down? And I thought something really bad happened. He goes, I don't think you're going to believe this, Dad, but um, last night in my prison cell, totally dark. I was alone. Nobody was in there. Um, no one turned any lights on. There was no literal electric bulbs on, but my prison cell got filled with light. And he said, he said, uh, he said uh, Dad, I, he said, you know, I've heard all of Grandpa's sermons and I've heard all your sermons and I heard these people speaking in tongues and all this stuff. And he goes, to be honest with you, it never made any sense. But last night, like in a minute, just this light of the love of Christ came into that prison cell and it just, it turned on. And all of a sudden, it just flooded into my mind. I, I just, oh yeah, that, salvation means that and redemption means this and justification means that. He was just like, <laughs> it was just like, a, like he put the, socket, the plug in the socket and it all came back to him. And then he just said, and, and I was just sitting there and I was laying down. I don't know what your theology is, Pentecost or not wise, if you're here as a guest today, but you know, we believe in speaking in tongues. And he just started speaking in tongues out loud, like almost screaming in his prison cell. I think the guards are probably thinking he's having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> And he goes, man, dad, I was cleansed. I was purified. I was washed. My mind was renewed. I, I just feel like a whole new man. Well, unbeknownst to me, I was pastoring in Colorado at the time. Uh, unbeknownst to me, there was not only my wife and I praying, but one of our elders in our church was praying. And not only was he praying for him to be set free from heroin and homelessness, but he was praying that here, here's an elder of a church who had a daughter, maybe 19, 20 years old, a virgin beautiful, pure, never smoked a cigarette, never sipped any alcohol in her life. He, can you believe this? He was praying that his daughter would marry my son. Isn't that wild? I, and I said, when, he, when Rob told me that, I said, man, I would never pray that from, 
for my, if, if, if my daughter, and if I knew somebody that was on the streets using drugs, I would never pray that, that my daughter would marry that guy. And he goes, no, I know what God's gonna do. Man, that's just encouraged us so much. And, uh, and I'll just never forget the day where I was standing up here in our, my church and the doors opened in the back and my son walked down the aisle with this beautiful bride, or he was standing here in front. She walked down, got married to this. He's been, uh, he's been clean, clean and sober now for six years, married, has two kids, just loving on Jesus, ministers to people all around. Uh, just For me, with the breakthrough came when we stopped trying to fix it ourselves and we started just pleading the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Lord, it's the blood of Jesus. We can't do anything about this. We can't fix it. We can't cure him. We can't even help him. Not, there's not a word I could say to him. He knows all the words I could say. He memorized large portions of scripture from Sunday school days. He had to have the blood of Jesus just pour over him and we just pleaded the blood of Jesus over him. And that's, that's, that's a powerful authority in your life the blood of Jesus. If you're in a situation in your marriage right now where you just can't solve it, you can't, you can't rationalize through this. It's, it's, it's not flesh and blood, right, brothers? It's powers and principalities. And the only, the only effect on powers and principalities is not your smarts or your mind, your cleverness, your street smarts. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that, that cancels all the debt, that washes away all these things, that gives you a whole new start in your marriage. That's hope for your marriage. And sometimes even in this, and this is gonna sound like I'm contradicting myself in doubt, because I've been pastor long enough that I wanna be honest with my church, okay? Because sometimes guys will do this. I plead the blood of Jesus over my marriage and the wife still leaves them. But I say this, still plead the blood of Jesus over your life, that you're cleansed, that you're pure, that you're washed, that you're holy, that you, God, is, God can take the, what the enemy meant for evil and turn to good. And so keep pleading the blood. Don't base the bleeding of the blood on circumstances, Place it on the finished work that Jesus has done for you, for your heart, for your mind. You may not be able to control every circumstance. You see, my son came back and is serving the Lord. My best friend's daughter had an overdose and died. And so you can't, you can't, you can't promise people certain things. You know, bad things happen in our world, but you can promise this, that the blood of Jesus, you can plead it over circumstances, and there is authority in that, and there's certainly authority in your life, in your mind, in your heart. My son took authority in his life, and the blood of Jesus cleansed him. And then the second thing it says here is by the word of their testimony. And so with, with accusations comes, <coughs> with accusations come agree agreements. A-G-G, -G. is there two G's in agreement? A-G-R-E-E-M-E. -E -E. What I like to do is like have such bad penmanship, people can't tell I, I don't spell correctly. And that's, that's a good strategy there. Uh, but, but agreements, accusations are going to come, right? Um, pleading the blood of Jesus over an accusation most likely will not stop Satan from accusing. It, 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 to stop Satan from accusing would be, have to make Satan stop being Satan because his name alone means, I'm, uh, that's my name, I'm an accuser, that's what I do for a living, I accuse. And so, until he's finally destroyed and put in the pit forever, he's going to keep doing that. So you don't have any control over him. So you, uh, in some ways, you, you can have the renewal of your mind and you can have a strong, strong mind that, that resists the devil, but he's gonna keep doing what he does. He, did it, he tried it with Jesus even, three temptations in the wilderness. So he's nonstop, he's dogged, and he's gonna... He's gonna the problem is not the accusations. The problem is our agreements, our agreements. So, so I'm in Africa and Satan says to me, you're such an idiot. And I go, I'm such an idiot. Satan says, you're a loser. And I say, I'm a loser. Satan says, you're not a good husband. And I say, I'm not a good husband. You see what's happening? We're agreeing with the accusations. And that's where the power of the accusation comes from. The, the accusation itself has no power. The power is when we're agreeing with it. We lose our authority when we're in agreement with the things that Satan says. And, what, and, and, and listen to this. When we agree with Satan, we are actually having more faith in Satan than we are in God. It's like, like we say, I have, I, oh, I trust in Jesus. A lot of times we, we probably want to raise our hands and say, oh, I trust in Satan. I believe what he says about me. He, he tells me I'm not going to make it and I'm, I'm, I'm there. Yeah, I'm not going to make it. How many of us are, are confessing what Satan says? How many of us are believing what Satan says? Rather than the renewing of the mind by the pleading of the blood of Jesus and the second thing, by the word of our testimony. 
So they started saying something else about themselves. So Satan would say to them, uh, you're, you're gonna fail again. And they're tested, but no, the blood of Jesus is gonna keep me from that. And my testimony now is gonna be, I'm not a failure. I'm not gonna fail. So this is not just uh, good thinking. You know, this is not just, um, I don't know what they call that word, uh, affirmations. This is a belief in your heart. This is becoming, by, become, by becoming renewed in your mind. You're, you're actually not just trying to drum up some disagreement with Satan. You're actually in disagreement with him. You actually don't believe he's right. Yeah. The blood of Jesus has changed that situation about him. And now we are seeing the, the freedom that we have in Christ. And we're, uh, and we're breaking these agreements. The testimony is I'm breaking that agreement. I'm no longer gonna believe those lies about me. I'm no longer, and not only are the lies about others, but sometimes Satan lies and destroys our joy by lying about other people. Uh, your church is no good. Your church lets you down. The church is a failure. Your pastor said that. Your, your small group doesn't understand you. Your wife uh, is, is, is you know, bitter. Or, you know, and, and we start agreeing with things like that rather than just saying, hey, I live in a fallen world and people are gonna fail me. And not to have an expectation of perfection in the body of Christ. Expect the glory of God to be present, but expect the accusations to come up against it. But your agreement is by the word of your testimony. Does that make sense to you? Your testimony is, is, <coughs> is there. You're saying, I'm pleading the blood, and my testimony is the same testimony that's found in Hebrews. I mentioned it in our first session. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word. And so when you're pleading the blood of Jesus... You're, you're not just trying, uh, it's not just some mental game playing. You're actually walking in this better agreement that Jesus makes in your life. It, he's speaking a better word. If you remember, I drew the thing of the, the two shoulders, you know, and there's these voices that are coming against you. The, the blood of Jesus is speaking this better word, and then you're repeating it back in your own heart, in your own mind. You're, uh, uh, that's, this is where scripture memorization uh, comes in, in play. It's not just so you can be a smart Christian or win the, win the pin on the Bible Academy thing when you're having the, the Bible verse memory games. This is, this is to be able to do battle with these accusations, with these lies, with the, with the assaults, and be aware of things that are going on in your heart. But not to, this is, you know why this is such good news? Is because the authority is such good news because you can now be aware of what's going on in your heart and not be afraid of what's in your heart. Because some people don't want to face, it's too hard, it's too, it's too painful, it's too, it's too dark. I don't want to face those things. Well, when you understand your authority, you, you can break agreements with all these things going on in your heart. Then you're free to delve deep into your own heart and say, God, thank you that you have the power to redeem this. And lastly, it says, and they, for they love not their lives even unto death. This speaks to me of, of, of not trying to build your own life, of not trying to win the victory in your own power, but you're trusting in this delegated authority and laying down your life for this thing. In other words, th this is a real battle I'm in and I'm willing to, to fight to the last drop of blood. I'm willing to, to give it my all. When you do that, I think it helps us translate scripture that is difficult for us to understand. You see, how many of us have, if we were super, super honest with ourselves and said, I, I listen to some of these scriptures and I claim some of these scriptures, but they kind of don't seem to work. Uh, you know, like, uh, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Well, then why did I have a car wreck and break my back in two places where I almost couldn't walk for, uh, I wasn't sure I'd be able to ever walk again. Why did I have cancer? Uh, that th sure seems like there's some weapons formed against me. Is it my lack of faith? Is it my failure? Um, well, see, I, as you understand the battle that we're in, it gives you a new perspective on some of these scriptures. So I look at that, no weapon formed against me. I see it as in a whole new light now. I see it, I got my shield, I got my sword, I got the breastplate, I got all the padding on, and, and I'm coming, the enemy's throwing these fiery darts, these accusations at me, and, and, and it says no weapon formed against me is gonna prosper. What does that mean? It's, well, it sure feels like it's prospering. I just got hit in my shoulder by an arrow. You know, but you know, here's, my, here's my take on this. I'm, I'm moving ahead. And these arrows are coming. And I'm moving ahead. And I got hit you know, by, a, by a, a rock from a, you know, somebody throwing a rock. And I got hit in my leg. And now I'm limping. And I got an arrow in my shoulder. But I'm, it's just like gladiator, right? You know, it's just like, uh, that's not going to prosper. Oh, yeah. Hit me again. It's not going to prosper. I'm going to, and I keep, to me, that's how I see that scripture now. I don't see it as being like, 
oh, thank God I'm a Christian because I'll never have anything hit me ever again. Nothing will ever hurt me ever again. Nothing will ever come against me again. No, all these things will come against you. As a matter of fact, because you're a Christian, maybe the, the battle might even be harder, but it's not gonna prosper. It's not gonna prosper. You're, you're going to prosper. You're going to win in the middle of that battle. All these accusations and these lies are gonna be broken down. The, the, the curse that's placed upon your life from words said over you are gonna be broken in the name of Jesus. They did hit you, yes. You're honest about them, but you're not giving up. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. One other passage of scripture that, that I've always had to wrestle with a little bit is, I came to give you life and uh, an abundant life. And sometimes I feel like, Man, I'd hate to see what life is like if it's not abundant because this one's not doing too good right now by itself. It's like, what do you mean by abundant life? And again, it's not sort of like, you know, you wake up and you smell, you know, your fresh coffee and daisies are coming through your windows and birds are landing on your windowsill singing Bob Marley songs to you or whatever, you know, Uh, three little birds on my window. Uh, I'm not seeing it like that. We're in a battle. That's how I started this session today with you. We're, We're on a battleship. We're not on the cruise liner. We're on a battleship. And so the abundant life for me is, man, uh, I got in an accident. The doctor said this thing about me. My son was in that situation, but I'm alive. And and not just surviving, man. There's there's a life in me that's that's through this. There's that, that life I describe more as victory now as love right now, as power, as a sound mind, as the authority of the gospel that is given to me. It's, uh, I used to translate abundant life being everything's gonna go good in my life. But now I'm seeing it, no matter what's going on in my life, it's gonna go good. God's gonna be in control. He's gonna protect me. He's gonna watch over me. He's gonna lead and guide me. So I close with this. Man, I wanna encourage you guys to get in the fight. That's all I've been talking about today is the authority that you have in your life to break these agreements and so if you are thinking of an agreement right now, I'm gonna ask the worship team to come back. If you are thinking of an agreement right now that you've made with an accusation, uh, I just want you to take a moment and just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Maybe there's something, as I've been speaking, you've already got it identified. If not, would you mind just, just bowing your head a moment or however you feel most encouraged when you're talking to the Lord? It's like this, this last thing we're saying, like loving not your life even to the point of death, saying like, I'm in a battle and I'm gonna win the victory even if it costs me my, my last drop of blood. I'm gonna win the victory over, over these accusations. What is the accusation that he says about you? What are the lies he speaks? Or what are even some of the truths that he's accusing you that you now know that Jesus has taken to the cross? And, and where have you agreed with that? And let's just take a moment and say, Lord, I, I wanna offer that up to you now. And, uh, or where are, the, where are the real conflicts in your life? Is it in your marriage? Is it with the... I'm gonna guess, how many of you, if you don't mind being real honest with me, how many of you have prodigal children? Would you just raise your hand if you, I don't know if you guys wanna look around a little bit, but it's probably 75%. I see that everywhere I go, even when I do pastor's conferences, almost 80% of the pastors raise their hand and say, I have a prodigal child. So you're probably, so dads, you're probably going like, what did I do wrong? Any of that happen in your life? Or if I'd have done this better? Those are called accusations, and we want to cast those accusations down. We want to bring those things down, and, and we also want to plead the blood over our children, over our marriages. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but some of you would probably honestly say, man, my marriage is really in turmoil right now, and I need to plead the blood of Jesus over this. I, I need to have it uh, to, 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 in my own mind to speak that better word. Uh, you know, some of you are dealing with, with temptations, addictions, uh, substance abuse or pornography, and you're saying, you know, man, I just I feel this the accuser that that I'm that I'm not holy, that I'm not good, that I'm not the blood doesn't cleanse me, and and, and Jesus wants to free you of that today. So just just wait on Him now, Father. We do we wait on You. We're not afraid to let You speak to us, Jesus. Lord, we we've come here to do business with You, God. <laughs> There's, there's things in our life that we walked into this building wrestling with that we can walk out of here overcoming, having authority over it, breaking the chains, being delivered, being delivered. Stand with me if you would, brothers, if you don't mind, stand with me. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, ask for those who wanna come up to the front. If you just sense there's something the Lord's doing today and you just wanna have prayer over it, would you mind stepping out of your seat and coming to the front? It could be, again, the prodigal child in your life, the marriage, the accusations, the, 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 the struggles, the battles you're in. Come up to the front here. Could be the work you're doing, the organization you're in, uh, the, the job you're on, the, the struggles. Step out of your seat right now. Come to the front. 
Come on, guys, there's gonna be a lot of you. I know there's, I know there's, there's dozens in this room here right now that are, that are uh, in the middle of that battle right now. Others that are not, hang on, it'll get to you. Yeah, come on, guys. <laughs> come on ahead. You can still keep coming. There's, there's some others of you that just, Holy Spirit's tugging at your heart right now. He wants you to let this work of the Holy Spirit do something really good in your heart. Let's go ahead and sing a, let's, let's sing a song while you're coming forward and just waiting on the presence of God. Just speak to him right now, casting down all these vain imaginations. We're gonna agree together in prayer. The two or three agreeing on anything in, in the midst, the Holy Spirit will be here. Give us that authority. Brothers, I want you to take authority in your own situation and, and the fellows who are praying for you to take authority. Just plead the blood of Jesus over them. Speak a better word over that testimony that Jesus is going to, the Lord's going to set you free. And I just pray over you as well in the name of Jesus. I think a couple guys come around here. There's a few on this end, down on that end as well. If you could, a few more down here. We need some prayer team right over here. If you could, please. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Just go ahead and pray over them right now. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. There's no condemnation. Hallelujah. There's victory in Jesus. There's victory, there's breakthrough right now. There's an anointing for breakthrough right now. Captives being set free, captives to lies, captive to addictions, captive to false words spoken over them. I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, that you're here to set us free. We thank you, Jesus, that you're, that, that you're more than words, but you're in your power. Power, power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Bless us.